Just quick introduction. I'm Jeff Richards. I'm one of the managing partners at GGV Capital, a global venture capital firm. And we're also lucky to be investors in Workboard and, and sit on the, a couple of boards with Margo. So let me, uh, nobody's here to hear me. Let's jump right in. And, and uh, Deidre and Margo, maybe you can introduce yourselves and we'll start with Deidre. Great. Welcome, everybody. I'm Deidre Paknad. I'm co founder and CEO at Workboard. I uh, both use OKRs to drive growth at my company and help other companies do that. Margo. Thanks, Deidre. Uh, great to be here and see everybody. Um, I'm Margo Georgiotis. I'm a longtime tech executive at places like Google and Ancestry. And now I spend a lot of time investing and advising companies across all different stages of growth from the very beginning all the way to how do you get to billions. So it's great to be here and looking forward to the conversation. So let, um, let, let, let's start out with kind of an easy layup question, which, um, you know, when I post about OKRs on Twitter and LinkedIn, I get all kinds of reactions. And I think one of the challenges, and I always sort of frame this as like, what is it? What is the greatness that people are trying to achieve using OKRs? Deidre, maybe you could kick things off. And just talk a little about what is it? What is the nirvana? And I know there's sort of a higher purpose beyond OKRs that you talk a lot about, but can you just talk a little bit about what, what is it? Where are companies trying to go in, in using this, this, this concept? If you move the acronym out of the way, right? And it trips people up and they attach a lot of things to the acronym that maybe are aren't there. But at its essence, I think of it as a language or a syntax for aligning on outcomes and a method or a technique of being very intentional about aligning the organization and teams in the organization on the strategy you're trying to drive. Just being very intentional about that. The nirvana part comes in, um, not just in getting everybody aligned, but that alignment and having a common language or the same syntax for describing the outcomes we want to create gives people clarity that makes it possible to have accountability for achieving the strategy and driving it forward. And it's a basic form, a method for alignment and accountability on strategy execution, which it's hard to argue about the goodness in having that in your organization. Right? And, and let me just, before I, I, I want to ask Margo, because I know Margo, you, you worked at Google, which sort of famously pioneered a lot of this concept, but Deidre, what, you know, because a lot of companies would say, well, we are aligned today. We don't use OKRs. We are aligned today. You know, what's missing in that equation? And, and when you talk about that greater transparency and accountability. So on its face, of course, you can be aligned without using this specific syntax, right? There are a bunch of other frameworks. B2Mom, many of our customers use that one. Some use Hoshin Conry. Moving the label out, right? A shared syntax is super important. So for example, if Margo and I were going to have this conversation about OKRs and I was going to speak Portuguese and Margo decided she was going to speak French or Spanish, <laughs> and maybe you went with Italian... We, you know, if we were each fluent in those languages, we kind of sort of know what the other person means, but we wouldn't actually know, right? We, the, the true clarity would be um, missing. We'd have a fuzzy sense of alignment uh, and maybe we'd have false confidence, right? And the, the thing about, I think, whatever syntax you use and whatever approach you use, when you're a small company, let's say you're 50 people in the same building, alignment is cheap. It just comes for free with your rent, right? right? When you're a hundred people in your same building, still pretty inexpensive. You can get it by like going to get a coffee in the kitchen. A hundred people and everybody works from home. Eh, you probably don't have as much as you think. 500 people, you're delusional. Unless you're intentional about alignment, you don't have enough of it. You don't have as much as you could have. And if you don't have everybody aligned, it means that some people are working at odds with the mission. They're working on guesswork not on certainty or confidence or clarity. And their guesswork, honestly, it sucks for them. It sucks for you if you're trying to grow the business, right? That doesn't feel great to know a quarter later, it didn't matter. And there's a Marcin um, at Malwarebytes is an awesome CEO, young guy, started this company out of his dorm room now 10 years ago, right? 1400 people or so now. And he described like the terrible sensation when he'd be talking to a some engineer and they'd be really excited and tell him what they were working on. And he said, and it was really, really hard for me as a CEO, not to say, dude, that just doesn't matter. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> like, and I couldn't lie and say it did matter. Right. right. It, but it just, 
it just didn't matter. And he said, and like the look on the person's face when I just told the truth was horrible. And it's like, I had to find another way to make sure people could take the positive energy and then put it in the most creative places for the, for the company and for the mission. They want that. And you want that too. It's such a great point because the, we get this request from so many of our companies when they start to hit that growth stage inflection, whether it's you know, 10, 20, 30 million of revenue or a hundred people or 200 people or 500 people. And then I think a lot of people really felt it, as you mentioned, when we went to remote work, because it just broke apart a lot of the cultural norms around getting alignment in person. Margo, how about from, from your point of view, I know you have um, a, a many years of experience uh, around alignment and OKRs at Google, and then also working as a board member and an investor with a lot of founders and CEOs. Can you just talk a little bit about how you view this in the broader scheme of management and growth? Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Um, and I, you know, really kind of want to just add one simple concept to what Deidre was saying that for me, growing up at Google, um, but then taking that same practice and taking it to other companies where as a CEO, I just think about it as when you're, when you're trying to grow at speed, right, which especially with the valuations that people are getting and the kind of capital people are raising, there's this whole feeling like I got to hire people really fast. The business has to be moving. Um, really fast to, to grow into that. It's about how do you make sure that you've got velocity built into your business and your decision making. And so that's really how we used OKRs um, at Google. It was a way to really debate and discuss as a leadership team, what was that really focused set of messages, the, um, those metrics that were really underpinning what was going to drive velocity in the company. And then ensuring that everyone was aligned in moving those together. And what that did was really enable discussions to be focused always monthly and quarterly on what's the speed of progress, right? Never on activities. It's really on is what we're doing actually changing the shape of the curve and what can we do individually and collectively to get more momentum? And that sounds really you know, kind of obvious, but actually it's not. It forces a really, really deep discussion in, in the company around what is the primary and secondary drivers of momentum. And then if you're losing momentum, your team is really focused on bringing solutions to address those gaps versus just kind of sitting there reporting the facts and then debating often. Like if you're in meetings and you find you're often debating if the data is right or things like that, <laughs> then you know- We've all been there. Right, that you haven't- <laughs> You got, don't have it. And to me, I think about the symptoms of lack of alignment. You know, if you, you can't articulate as a leadership team in two minutes, the three drivers of momentum, if you're not able to go into your meetings and truly have people focus on the leaning forward and what we're going to do to gain momentum, you're kind of reporting facts and debating. Um, you know, and down the line in the team, are trade-offs getting surfaced early? And is the team showing up? Are they asking the leadership team, right, to make a call or are they coming mm -hmm. in having already thought about what the options are, right? And so I think when you have this done well, very few issues get kicked upstairs because the team is coming in saying, look, we know we're trying to get here. This is not going as well as we thought. These are the two things that we think we need to do different. And maybe you can, you know, have a debate about that and ask a few clarifying questions, but it completely changes the rhythm in the company. And when teams get into it, it's in just an incredible feeling because it simplifies everything, reporting, meetings, and board prep, however you think about the company. And when people feel like they're gaining velocity in discussions and they're making decisions, they just feel so much better about coming to work. I love the idea that, that so much of this is about deciding what matters. You know, it's, I was just thinking when, when we had a, a president join a company last year, and in the first board meeting, he said, you know, and, and he's working closely with the CEO. He said, but we just decided that a whole bunch of stuff we were working on didn't matter. And, and that happens a lot in high growth companies because everybody is building teams and working on a lot of projects that they think matter, but it, it forces that conversation around alignment. And I guess, Deidre, back to you, when you, when you bring on a new customer or you see a company adopt this methodology, what is the gap? You know, what are typically the biggest gaps that they're moving sort of the from to, you know, we're operating this way and we're going to this scenario. What are the biggest gaps that you see? The, the dynamic they're usually living in the from is exactly what Margot just described, where there's an absence of clarity on which needles are we trying to move and how far right now. And so there's 
you spend more time in meetings, you're using the meeting to get the state of the state as opposed to make decisions based on the state. The leadership team's being asked to make every decision because nobody has enough clarity on what it is we're trying to accomplish that would just empower them to make decisions wherever they are in the organization that are most creative and most aligned, right? That um, you're you're getting bigger, but you're going slower. Uh, you're spending more of your time asking for data, asking for what matters, asking mm-hmm. where we are on that, and you're allocating more and more headcount in service of those give me information, give me information requests, and everybody else around you is doing the same thing. I think if you flip it to the other side of it, what it looks like in two is by the second week in the quarter, every team knows what matters at the company level, at the global level, which measures are the most important, right? What is the specific value we're trying to create this quarter in the context of this year? And they have radical clarity on which needles their team moves and how far. And if you know that by the second week of the quarter, you got 10 or 11 more weeks to just confidently crush it, mm-hmm, no mm-hmm. confusion. And then we've got clarity at the outset. We've got progress that everyone can see every step and along the way. So everybody has the data to make a fully informed and context, context rich decision. And you're meeting to de risk and to optimize, not to get updated on where we are, right? You're working on fewer things, harder, faster, and there's less, I'll call it just scatter and drift in the team, right? I think it shows up in the texture of it shows up as, as confidence across the organization yeah. on the value they drive now. And that feels different for everybody. And definitely for a CEO, it's got to make you more confident to know what's working and what's not working in real time versus sort of yeah. the when end the, of the month, oh shit moment where it's totally. like, wait a minute, we're so yeah. far off on hiring or you know, whatever it is. You start to see the from state often includes at the beginning, right? Often includes a, a founder CEO who's kind of pissed off at his, at his team and his org and um, uh, pissed off because the leaders they grew at home aren't in the middle, aren't doing a great job of translating up and down because people don't have clarity and how come they don't get it. And they maybe sometimes chronically overestimate their communication skills. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I've said it how many times, how come you still don't get it, right? And so they're a little bit, if you will, pissed off at the org that it's not moving fast enough, that people aren't clear enough, that people aren't taking ownership or accountability. Um, and you see the other side of that, people in the org feeling like, hey, I'm doing my best. I'm doing everything. I'm running as fast as I can. And it still doesn't feel like we're moving forward, right? It doesn't feel like we're getting, to Mar- Margo's word, enough, as much velocity as as the calories I'm putting out, right? The uh, It's a little bit of founder journey, right? Like to get accountability, you have to give clarity. Right. You just don't get it without that. Love and by that clarity, concept. I mean, on the outcomes that matter, right? What, what, let me ask a dumb question, but if, if we haven't, if I, as a CEO, haven't ever operated with this kind of clarity and accountability, <laughs> Is that uncomfortable? You know, I mean, how do you assimilate and how do you assimilate executives into a model where that's the model and maybe they've never operated that way? And, and, and Margo, maybe you could touch on this and I'll come back to data, but like that feels to me like a different way of working for, you know, it's like when, when an athlete goes to a hyper, you know, they go to the Patriots or the Warriors and they're like, oh my gosh, this is so different than, you know, the Cleveland Browns or whatever organization they came from. Cause there's just a much higher level of expectation of excellence. And this, this, feels like a model that could be uncomfortable for some folks. How do, how do you deal with that? Yeah, you know, it's really interesting because, um, you know, at Google, it was, we kind of inculcated people into that from the beginning. And we didn't hire a lot of people from the outside for a long time. And it was a huge mindset shift, you know, going to other companies like Ancestry and having to put this in place to gain velocity, you know, was a journey. It took like probably three quarters for people to truly get into it. And I would say the three biggest mindset shifts, um, you know, are this concept of outcomes versus activities. Most people, when they do OKRs, the big mistake is they, they don't focus on, as we're talking about, those drivers of velocity and have the discipline to say, 
the metrics that matter and that are interconnected and reinforcing. That is like real mental discipline, not just to make the list of the big projects that you need to do, especially like if sometimes in the engineering teams, right? They just want to say, we're replatforming right now. We're adding these functions, et cetera. What is it that I'm doing and how would I prioritize it so that I'm actually moving the whole piece forward? And how do I think front, back, inside of me? I think that that concept of what is the flywheel in the company, people say that a lot in their mm -hmm. investor meetings, but like the discipline to make those choices. Um, what is the North Star metric? Like I'll give a couple examples because I think it makes it real. Like we're scaling YouTube. We have like hours and hours of debates around where we focused on minutes per session or absolute number of users when we're first scaling the platform. And both of those led to totally different product and engineering requirements. And so, because if you wanted to go minutes per user, you had to understand the sessions better. You had to think about recommendation of the next video and all this kind of stuff. If you're just trying to get more and more people, you were just trying to amass more content and bring more people to experiment on the platform. And through that learning, you could then build out the verticals and not having that debate is pretty material. And so you can see companies or at Ancestry before I got there, there was big misalignment between say the science side doing the DNA or the people that were building the ancestral research service. And we all aligned around the fact that our North Star metrics were net subscriber growth, right? So that made you think about the quality of people taking those mm -hmm. DNA tests mattered and then active discovery rate. And those were the two things that the entire company was obsessed about. And it forced everyone to really think about and getting to those may sound like super obvious when I say it. <laughs> it wasn't super obvious how you did find that, what went into it, and then that cascaded and drove all the other metrics through to the revenue. Um, and I think the other piece that's really important is when you're scaling fast, you need to keep reframing what great is. Because like a great idea... Hmm when you're trying to do things that are tens of millions is very different when it's hundreds, five hundreds or billions. And that's very disconcerting for the organization, particularly the people, sometimes the original product line versus the new product lines, because as you scale, right, what seems like, so the core business might be growing at 30, 50, right? But then the new stuff has to grow at 250, 300, 500, right? For that to matter, that's very hard for people to like get their mind around it and org. How you build these scalable platforms and arguing about, is that scalable? Is that activity that we did last quarter, can we keep doing that next quarter and hit these scale targets? So that also forces people to think about those outcomes that they have to achieve and reframing it from the top down, right? How you actually build scalability into the organization. And I think if you OKRs are used well, that's how they're used. But that's a very different mindset shift than a bunch of people in verticals all making their goals and then showing up and then sharing them with each other. So I think if you think about that's what's <laughs> happening in your org is each functional area, which is easy to do, right? You just added a ton of people. You hired a bunch of people now running each one of these functions. And I see this all the time with yeah. companies that are going fast. You brought in all these new people and they want to build their own stuff, right? And then everyone gets to the top and it actually doesn't actually add up to what everyone thought. And so I think this is where things usually go wrong. That's why the 100 to 500 becomes an issue. You have now heads of each one of your areas and silos kill speed. So if you bring people in with different cultures, different mindsets, and you don't commit as a leadership team, the one, sometimes it took us at Google one or even two days, believe it or not. <laughs> I know that sounds painful because it sounds like process, but it's not. If when you get together, if everybody on the leadership team shows up, literally this is the process, they show up, you as the CEO are required to come in and you have to have really thought through what you think the choices are for the North Star metric and why then have each one of your executives show up to that meeting with a list of their goals. But it's not just their goals. They also have to bring in the top things that they need from others and a sheet that says, what are the three trade-offs that you think are likely to be needed for the collective to be successful? And then literally sit there and debate that cascade down. And all of a sudden, it, it actually takes a day sometimes too. But when you guys get that right at the top and then you pull that down through the org, through a systematic process, which software makes this so much easier, 
then you really know that you're aligned. And I think that's what high performing teams are about at rapid scale. Okay, Adrian, anything you'd add? I, I do have a question from the audience I wanna, I wanna throw out there for you that's relevant to this. I wanna pick up on the, it takes time. It's a messy conversation. It's so incredibly worthy of the intellectual horsepower of not only the leadership team, but teams in the org who all have to make a set of choices. Like the options for the route are many. The best option is, is actually fewer, right? Than the total number. And that messy conversation, I think, is um, the first the first time teams do OKRs are pretty daunted by that. Mm. It's like, oh my God, we'd have to, like, it would take us three hours to get set our OKRs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The three hours you spend figuring out what matters this quarter means the 530 hours you have in the quarter are high leverage. And it's such an f- interesting sort of uh, reaction to, oh, we'd have to talk about it. Oh, I don't know. That sounds hard. Like, yes. Welcome to leadership. <laughs> it's actually hard. You've yeah. got to actually make a set of real choices from imperfect data, imperfect options. And, and you have to be a betting leadership team. When you ask the question of how, how do leaders who haven't done this before, how do they think about it? One of the gaps I observe is they're, uh, they're a set of leaders who've never thought about it and their, their mindset doesn't work this way. But often for founders in particular and really you know, super missionary founders, their brain does work this way. They are, they're already hyper mm-hmm. aware of the need for all those silos to converge. They're often the only person in the org who's thinking laterally. Everyone else is thinking vertically through their function. And they're thinking about, and maybe they live and they dream the North Star metrics and they can't see anything else when they close their eyes. And, and one of the dynamics I see is they, they think everyone else thinks that way. Right. And they're just assuming or relying on or their, their mental model for how people think, all people think is the way they think. And the gap between how clear that is in their head and how lateral they think and everyone else in their leadership team and, and beyond that leadership team, that gap can be huge, but their awareness of the gap limited. And that shows up as, anger and frustration, right? That the team doesn't yeah. get it and how to come they don't get it. And, and it, my advice then is it's your job as the CEO and the leader, it's your job to provide an on-ramp to that way of thinking, a method and a mechanism and the expectation that the organization will do the exercise, have the messy conversations for everyone to be thinking, not just about their silo, but be thinking laterally, how do we get the most yeah. leverage to move us closer to the mission and the vision? Yeah, uh, my partner Glenn did a great podcast with Josh Silverman, who's the CEO of Etsy, and he talked about when he came into Etsy, everybody was focused on a million different things, and he he basically said to the entire organization, everything we do is focused on growing GMV, so every goal and objective is going to line up under that, and it was just incredibly empowering for the organization. It's a very simple concept, but we sometimes forget that not everybody in the organization understands what that simple North Star, your point about the YouTube metrics, uh, Margot is a good one. So one of the questions somebody asked is, what advice do you have for people? This is a very tactical question, but when setting the OKRs, how, what's the, you know, you mentioned an all day process or a three hour process, but like at a very tactical level, is it a once a quarter, you get together for two hours with the management team and it's something that you run? Does your chief of staff run your, your head of, you know, how, Tac, give us tactics on how a growth stage company should be running the process of setting the OKRs for the company. My process aligns with Marco's <laughs> leadership team, which is the beginning, is the first and needs to be the strongest signal. The leadership team, actually, we step out for at least a day and twice a year, two days. We do that because the world changes very, very, very quickly. And if you're in hyper growth mode, you're, you're sort of compressing three years every hundred days. And so the, the time to pause and think and to take stock and to deeply consider, not superficially consider where you are, what's true internally, what's true externally, what matters now, what's in front of us, that time is, I think, actually super high leverage. So at the leadership team level, I think it's a day, at least uh, every skip quarter, two days alternating with that. Teams below that look to your signal right? They don't need two days to probably to figure it out. What we see, find, whatever is in the early, let's say the first three quarters you're doing OKR cycle, 
it is a three hour conversation. Sometimes it's a four hour conversation when you don't have a strong alignment muscle and where you don't have a strong measure to learn culture. You've got to build those muscles and you know, you, that means you've got to work them out and they hurt and all those things. But as you start to build the muscle of measuring, of learning and iterating, of really genuinely aligning, which means saying no to things, right? Not chasing shiny pennies. That's the learned part. <laughs> then I think the conversation gets leaner and more efficient and teams really develop what I think of as an operating ritual that is pretty high efficient. Still, it's a real conversation because it involves real choices, right? And that um, making hard choices sort of the essence of strategic thinking. Really. And to Margot's point, uh, Deidre, do you, do you have the team point out the things you're not going to do? What are the trade-offs we're making? I love that concept because there's yeah. a tendency in high growth companies to want to tackle everything. I love zero KRs. We are going to spend zero time, zero dollars and run zero marketing campaigns on this sector and on this value proposition. I love the clarity that comes from that, right? And then the signal that we can all align on is it's just abundantly clear. And I love that because I've seen so many teams where the leadership team says what we are gonna do. And, and everyone, like for example, let's focus on these segments because higher GRR, higher NDR, higher mm-hmm. AOV, mm-hmm. right? Shorter sales cycle, that's where we're gonna grow fastest. And the rest of the org decides, that's nice. That's nice. Those other people can focus on those segments. We're going to keep doing our thing yeah. over here. And the, the zero KR is like what we're going to do zero of just, it only takes one quarter of those before people say, Oh, Oh, oh I get it. We're That's really powerful. not going to do yeah. that other stuff. I see what you mean by that. Margo, any tips, tactical tips here on setting. Okay. So maybe one thing you could add in, cause it's a question somebody just asked is when you're setting and then the world changes around you right? The business changes or the market changes, or you need to make changes. How do you roll that into that process of setting and managing OKRs? Yeah. I mean, I, I think in really fast growth companies, um, you know, you, when you're really focusing on velocity, I think it's about really zeroing in on the, I think the top two metrics that the whole company is anchored to. And then after that, maybe six to 10 and those, uh, those I think are what's worthy of the executive team offsite. And again, I said, I, I, I found the simplest thing is like literally ask people to bring three sheets of paper. What are, what are my goals, right? What do I need from others to be successful? And what do I believe on the third sheet are the most important areas of, of trade-off that, that I can foresee? Cause it forces everyone to own that conversation. Okay. I do think the leader, the CEO has to come in with their point of view on the North Star metrics, then I think it just becomes like breathing. So all the business meetings should all ladder. So your weekly business cadence should be driving to that. Um, Each of the drill down meetings within different shared areas, right? It's just using that same data. And then I think the leadership team is accountable once a quarter to get together and say, what is the real velocity here? Where are we falling ahead and where do we need to reallocate? And, you know, I remember Google, we used to call it, we pour gas on hockey sticks, right? And we need to be fail forward fast and retrench on the stuff that's not working. And I think that's where the leadership team, if there's new information that says this is going to take longer for the product team to execute it, or this other thing is really heating up, then you make those forceful decisions to, mm-hmm. to make, to make those calls. And then you communicate those right in your monthly town halls. It also creates amazing um, esprit de corn alignment in the company. When the leadership team is saying, this is what we're measuring ourselves and success on. And you show up in a town hall every month and you share people, those metrics, the whole company, what it, I think does that's really incredible is the quality of the conversation bottom up totally changes because everybody understands what the goals are and their ability to then ask relevant questions, right, is so much higher because they have context for what the company is trying to achieve overall. And they're much more likely to bring up issues and opportunities against that framework. And it, that's why I said it takes like two, three quarters of people Right, the leadership team getting aligned, cascading and showing that in the town hall every month, ask letting those questions show up. And I think that's why it feels so good in an organization when this is in place, 
because you truly feel that sense of collective momentum, collective ownership to those common goals. And so I think it's really worth the messiness, you know, having, again, it's great to be at Google. That's how we grew up. But, you know, then when I became a CEO of other companies, I really said to myself, okay, let's like, let's do this. And like traditional companies, tech companies, and it didn't matter where it got applied, right? The same process occurred. It felt super uncomfortable in the first two quarters. And then all the people were like, why did we not do this before? This is so <laughs> much better, like so much yeah. more transparent. But I think you have to fight through that kind of wallow curve. Um, but once you hit that momentum, Right, you get away from the silo decision meetings, the meetings before meetings, the meetings without decisions where people walk away with questions about the data, the senior team feeling like, you know, if you feel like people are asking you to make decisions that you're like, why are we making the decision? Why are we even talking about this? You know that you have a problem, right? Or even your employee surveys, you see little hints around, you know, cross-functional alignment, employee empowerment, right? All those are like red flag signals for a leadership team, right? Needing to do this proper alignment and cascading. And so I just think, you know, it's actually just more fun. Mm -hmm. You know, Margo, that your, um, your point on the town halls and when those met those same measures are shown again and again and again, uh, and when facts change, you iterate on those. The, to go back, Jeff, to like why OKRs and why that framework. And one of the things that um, makes it possible to have the richer town hall conversation. So you have sort of top down, bottom up, everybody's actually speaking the same language. The language is on the outcomes that really matter. And there's high fluency around that, right? It's, um, it's not that the leadership team is talking metrics and everyone else is talking activity. Mm -hmm. Right, which is, I think, one of the breakdowns, right? Like, I don't know what that means. I don't know how to apply that to me, but I, what I just heard the CEO say in the town hall versus, oh, I know exactly how that applies to what we're doing this week. And, and the CEO, when we talk at the team level, the CEO knows exactly the same. Oh, I, what I hear you saying, I know exactly how that fits and contributes to the strategy. The second part, the thing about OKR framework, which I think maybe trumps some of the others, VT Moms, Hoshin Conry, Pick Your Poison, is the quarterly cycle. It, mm -hmm. it assumes that it's a dynamic world. It assumes that you're going to learn actually something this quarter that you'd want to capture in some way, right? And I think for hypergrowth companies in particular, that's super important. The world changes incredibly fast if you're doubling or tripling. What time? Yeah, and scoring them. I think that's yeah. the one thing we didn't talk about is like scoring them red, red, yellow, and green, right? It's like reds are good. Like it becomes like people are like, reds are good. This is not working. What are we going to do about it? Can or, you talk about that, Margo? Because that was my yeah. next question. How do you deal, you know, this radical, this, this concept of transparency and accountability is great until you have a bunch of reds and people are like, oh my God, we suck. You know, how do you deal lean with that? Lean into the red, lean into Yeah, the red. how do you deal with that? Yeah, I think Reds are good. What does that mean? That's a huge part of the culture change, which is, you know, people don't look at OKRs as like an HR process. They look at it as how we run the business collectively and our ability to continue to gain velocity is driven by identifying the reds, <laughs> the reds and the yellow. I love that. And celebrating those and saying, wow, we really thought this was going to happen much faster than it did. Okay, why did that not work? Let's think about what we have to do differently to gain velocity. I mean, I, I think a big thing that happens in a lot of tech companies is you have tech debt, right? So yeah. you scale really fast. Then you want to add on these new capabilities, but you, your infrastructure just can't support that. And nobody's owned that, right? And the engineering teams are running around with their hair on fire, trying to like do all these kludgy things. And what somebody needed to do is raise their hand and say, we need to spend one quarter and fix this infrastructure because mm -hmm. it's not scalable. And once we fix that, then we can take off again. But if you don't force those reds to happen, nobody has those hard conversations. You could burn a whole year, right? Not fixing the e-commerce platform or not fixing, right? The structural engineering so that the product teams could be more productive. I see this happens all the time, <laughs> right? So you have this literally, I would say half of the companies that I work with, yeah. the infrastructure, they hire a whole ton of product people and the service backbone infrastructure on the engineering team is not capable of enabling all those people to be productive. And somebody has to call a spade a spade and say, we need to stop the madness because the more we go on with this, the more likely we are to hit the wall. But that's what OKRs really do because they force the reds, the honest red conversations, and they make it okay 
for people, because I think a lot of engineering teams want to be the hero, right? They never want to say no, they don't, right? But mm-hmm. at some point, that's not good for the company because you're going to lose velocity, right, over time. And so, you know, that's for me, that's a huge cultural shift. And when that happens, everybody just works so much better together because they realize we're on the same team. Like, I think one of the most important cultural um, values in any company is empowering each other. You have to empower each other with the information to help everyone collectively gain velocity. Nobody wins or loses on their own. I'd also add as a board member and an investor, you know, when for companies that don't use a model like this, when they tell you everything's great, you know, there's some reds. (laughs) It's just, they don't know what they are. And we see that a lot at these high, you know, you're going from 50 to hundred to 150, 200, and then all of a sudden things start to break. I love this idea of embracing the reds, you know, cause it just, it's, you know, Deidre, I know you use this the way you run the company, you log yeah. in to work board and run the board meetings and show never, us where the yeah. reds and yellows are. And it, and it prompts yeah. a great conversation. Yeah. And one of our big mantras, if you will, when we help customers adopt OKRs and the platform around it, right? Because if you use a platform, red shows really, 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 really quickly because it's just data, right? And the way we think about red is awesome. You just got the signal at the earliest possible moment. Mm -hmm. Now you have more days left in the quarter to de-risk, to triage, to optimize, to do whatever it is you need to do to work with what's true. The not hide from it, right? Not bury it, not camouflage it, not don't look because you don't like how it looks, which is oddly a human behavior in so many places. But we also work with a lot of super large companies and to sort of if you if you build an organization that that fears the red versus leans into or embraces the signal what happens over time right is you you teach everyone that it's really better to look good than be good that being in the green gets rewarded and what that means is everyone sets their safety target right they aim for safety they aim for the thing they know for sure they can do mm. so they always stay in the green and the culture byproduct or implication of that is is enormous actually right where we literally by saying we're going to fear or punish people that come in in the red that come in under plan we literally are removing permission for ambition and we are institutionalizing a bias towards safety measures aiming for certainty not aiming for what we believe might be the most awesome outcomes and it, it, it's not true in a 500 person company, 5,000, like basically the year after you go public, yeah, <laughs> that starts to show up and it's not pretty. Right. And so how do you, if you will decalcify the instinct to, um, to look good, uh, and reinstitutionalize the idea to actually just first instance, let's try and be the best we can and learn what's between us and, and that greatness. So I so agree with that, Deidre. I mean, I think that's the biggest difference. What made Google so sustainably so successful year after year, right? You know, goals were set, right? So a 70 to 80% was seen as good, but like, how do you push the boundaries continuously? Because again, the OKRs are focused on what's going to drive momentum in the company. Mm -hmm. That's the big difference. It's not just the revenue, but it's thinking hard about, where are the velocity creators in the company? And, you know, Jeff, you and I have seen this in a bunch of the boards that we serve on together where we've had those tough conversations with the team. Like these, the financial metrics are looking really good, but show us the momentum drivers that's to say that's actually going to enable you to sustain that and scale it, right? And how do you evolve that thinking? Because as you scale and become more complex, right? You have more functions, you have more lines of business, right? You have a much bigger user base, like the discipline to actually be clear on what those couple of things are that will drive sustainable momentum and differentiation is like everything, I think, as you get into that growth stage. And it has to evolve because that thing that worked to get you to zero to 10 isn't going to get you from 10 to hundred or from hundred to a billion. Can we talk a little bit about the role of technology, right? So the concept of OKR has been around for 20 years. Um, but it's evolved now and, and Deidre, obviously I want to, I want to let you talk about this because you're in, in the middle of doing this with large organizations like Cisco, you know, down to high growth, uh, uh organizations, but what is the role of technology in this process and in, in this overall philosophy? And just talk about, you know, if I, if I'm not running OKRs today, 
or if I'm running them, but it's not terribly effective and I'm using Google Sheets or Excel or PowerPoint or whatever, what is what does tomorrow look like when I'm leveraging technology? Yep. I think the most obvious one is everyone can see every team's objectives and key results and the current progress against them every minute, anytime, on demand, wherever they are, whether they happen to be on a beach in Hawaii right now, or they finally went back to the airport and they're going on a business trip. It's just radical transparency to go with that radical clarity. The perfect scenario, and it's connected to Salesforce or Jira or Zendesk or whatever your CRM system is, or whatever your CX system is, right? That the actuals from related operating systems are actually flowing into the same system where your targets are. Because the real data you wanna know is, okay, if the target was a hundred, where are we now? Hmm. And what you mostly have without technology is we're at 60. Yeah, okay, but what were we trying to get to? <laughs> like, so what, is 60 good or bad? I don't know, right? It's the gap to plan where the decision is, where the triage is, where the DRS can optimize it, right? And with a platform that every team has all the time has a gap to plan. The second big deal is we work or connect OKRs to MBRs and ops reviews and business reviews. So I'm not doing any work to prepare for the board meeting. I'm not doing any work to prepare for the all hands to say, hey, these are the objectives and these are the key results that I'm looking at as CEO or that my head of sales is looking at or anything else, right? That those are just actually automatically populating a business review, a board review, a, a town hall, whatever, right? It's truly digital. So that we're presenting those objectives and the results in context, zero copy, paste, slide, create, blah, blah, right? None of that. And then they flow into my one-on-one. -on -one. So they're on the agenda already. So I'm talking about the reds in my one-on-ones on, on Monday. Yeah. Hey, Abby, our Sierra, what help do you need, right? The services delivery model is the most important key result for the next two years. <laughs> we're in the red. What help do you need? I know what to talk about, right? As opposed to I waste her 45 minutes and my 45 minutes because neither of us had the data, right? That like, it's a digital through line from the objectives and results we aligned on to the group and, and cross-functional meetings we're having in business reviews and ops reviews to the one-on-one -on -one and direct and, and staff meetings we're having at a team and an individual level. Like we never lose sight of why we're here and what we're working on. I love that concept. And Marco, you made this point as well, that you don't spend your time in the meeting looking at the data. You spend your time talking about, hey guys, what, how, do we, how do we accomplish what we want to accomplish from here? I, I just, I, you know, I, I was part of a public company for a while and oh my God, we spent hours and hours and hours looking at the data and everybody trying to figure out how we were doing against how we thought we were doing and very little time figuring out mm -hmm. what do we actually need to do to accomplish the mission for the next two or three months? It was, it was insane. Ultimately, Jeff, you you have the most um, crisp view on what technology is. Like you think about the CRM system analogy, right? It, you wouldn't imagine that you're going to run like the projection of your sales results. You're going to run that on slides and spreadsheets. Like who would do that? It was like yeah. an insane idea. And yet objectives and key results are, are the results forecast and projection for your entire strategy. Like, yeah, I but think that, let's go with slides. Yeah, I think it's such a great analogy because if, you know, a lot of folks here probably weren't in, in Silicon Valley in the 90s, but in the 90s, it wasn't a given that you had CRM. It was a relatively new concept. Salesforce, you know, was created in the late 90s. And prior to that, you had Siebel. But, you know, I was a CEO back then. And, you know, we struggled with getting accurate data about sales and sales forecasting. Now, no one would run a sales organization without CRM. And I think we're going to see a scenario where hopefully soon, but maybe it takes five years or 10 years, no CEO is going to run a company without software around OKRs and, and, and higher level performance management. It'll just be a default. How could you possibly run without it? I think it's a great analogy. Um, Margo, how about any, I know you work with a bunch of growth stage CEOs and, and often are coming to you for advice on alignment around execution and how do, you, how do you talk about this concept with them and, and what success have you had in helping folks move the ball forward in terms of adopting technology and, and becoming great in this area? And then I want to be conscious of time. We've, we've got about five minutes, so I, I'll, um, I may hit you guys with another audience question, but, but let's focus on that. And, and Deidre, maybe you can add in as well, because I know you have been a mentor to a number of CEOs that are building growth stage companies as well. 
I think we've covered a lot of the most important okay. pieces, right? I think it's, you know, CEOs really taking ownership for what their job is as the company is scaling. And as Deidre started this out, you know, they're a huge piece of their role is aligning everyone around the most important things that matter, making sure that there's one version of the truth, focusing facts, right? And that the company really focuses on what is most important and what needs attention and that that's done in a super forward looking and constructive way. Um, and that there's no meetings before the meetings, right? And <laughs> when this works really, really well, which I really see is the beauty, like you can see it in the board meeting, like Jeff, you know, I 100% the exact agree. examples, when you can see the chief of staff, the finance and the line business people are on the same page. It's just, things are just humming. It doesn't really, doesn't mean there aren't issues. It just means there's none of this, you know, and everyone's leaning forward, right? And going back to that fundamental feeling of, do we have velocity as a team, yeah. right? Do we have velocity because we're focusing on the right things? We have velocity because our meetings are super productive and focus on what matters and where we need to work better together. Velocity, right? Because, you know, we all feel like we're winning together. And, and for me, I think all founders actually want that. And they realize they no longer themselves, they can't scale themselves. So that's usually how I get into it with a founder. We go for a walk, they start describing like stuff that's <laughs> happening on the leadership team. And then I'll ask them a bunch of questions around, right? Their goal setting, right? How empowered people are to really run with it and to, re- to make decisions below them or only surface, right? The stuff that really counts. And that's when they realize, wow, you know, too many new people don't have, right? Everybody on the same hymn sheet. And then they invest the time and all of a sudden they're like, God, I can't believe I didn't do this before. And so sometimes you have to be a little inefficient to become incredibly efficient. And I think that's really what this is about. Can I just add one thing? Cause you mentioned something earlier that I think is a great point. I have seen organizations where this is viewed as an HR thing. Somehow it got embedded into HR software and people said, oh, it's an HR thing. How are your OKRs and your MBOs? If if you are a CEO, mm-hmm. you own this, right? And that that I think is an important, important concept if you want to make this work. Because if you have it... If you have it owned by HR and it's part of your HR software platform, you're, you're, you're not operating at the level that we're talking about. Correct. And if you're in the war for talent, the fastest way to lose people down the chain as you scale a company is to have these friction points. Yeah. Because when people, like I, I hear this conversation every day, when, co- pe- when people decide to leave, because I end up being the counselor to try to, you know, keep <laughs> I've talent been there. or recruit talent. Yeah. And the single biggest thing they say is, I love that early days, you know, as Deidre mm-hmm. described it before, when there was only one person for every function and we just ran based on trust because you could quickly and easily talk to people and energy dissipates with space. And I think what this is really all about is creating the alignment to create the positive energy so that when everyone's working together and that's what causes you to lose people down the chain because they feel like the company's getting big. I no longer understand what I'm doing and how it fits in. And so, you know, I think this used to just be the best way to run a business. Now, given the war for talent, and I think what will become an increasing war for capital, like this is something that you just must not do, yeah, right? I agree. It's just a must. I agree. When you do those exit interviews, which you do and I do, you know, the two most common things I hear from, from team members who leave is one, I don't believe the company can be successful anymore. And when you ask them why, they say, we're just trying to do too much, right? We don't know what our priorities are. We've lost the plot. We're not focused on the mission that we had in the early days. And a lot of that is just coming down to this. It's not, the, the company is not organized and aligned. Deidre, any final thoughts? And I, I want to be conscious of time and, and wrap. Any, any other thoughts from you? I would say for CEOs who want to start the journey, there's a couple things to think about. No matter what your size is, establishing one language for aligning on outcomes and both alignment and outcomes are really important in that, in that phrase one language across the organization from the early days gives you the best possibility of enjoying what Margot enjoyed at Google. Mm-hmm. Build it in early, period, period. Just speak the language of aligned on outcomes. Speak clearly 
and allow new people to join the organization to come along. For those organizations that are bigger, you've got a culture already, you've got some operating behaviors already, maybe you love them, maybe you don't. Um, then I think there's a couple things. You can help the team shift to what I call an outcome mindset, knowing the difference between output and outcome or activity and results. We work board have a bunch of programs, classes, seminars. Like It's easy to learn. Maybe CEO, you might not be the best coach, but there are coaches available. Also, you'll save burning your brain cells and frustration. <laughs> Just get help uh, on the coaching teams to come along. And in particular, that coaching can help them see why it's better for them, how it's liberating for them, how it unlocks their fullest potential as a team, why team sports get better, right? So really frame it in the context of why it's good for them and get help there. And then second, yes, use tools. It's digital. It's data. Your KRs are data and they're data you should be looking at every day. How, how often do your top customers, how, how often are the CEO, CFO, et cetera, logging into work for just as an example? Varies widely um, because you know it's the CEO of Humana and also the CEO of Guild or, right, right. or Toast, right? So a pretty different spectrum of people. Uh, the ones who are who have the highest urgency to drive velocity, they're daily. Wow. Okay. Right. So it's this Sunday, is a Monday, daily, weekly operating system for C level execs. Yep. This is the operating rhythm of the business. Love that. We align on outcomes quarterly. We do group and cross functional monthly biz reviews or ops reviews. We do weekly one on ones and staff meetings. And I'm tuned in Sunday night, Monday morning on what I need to de-risk and what I can optimize in the business. And I'm not wasting anybody's time trying to find the answer to that. I just have the answer to that. And to the point about our analogy to CRM, there's nothing else like that. If you're a CEO, you, it's not like you can log into the P&L every day and say, gosh, how are we doing as a company? It, it get, or, you know, the or books like, get closed let me go every check month. the HR system before the board meeting so I right. can find out how we're doing on strategy. Said no. So, so Adrian, I wanted, to, I wanted to just jump in. There's somebody who asked, how do you make sure you're not reacting too quickly when you're looking so often? And I wanted to come back to um, making sure that it's, it's about the fact that you can lead heads up versus mm -hmm. heads down. So actually when the data is transparent in front of you as a leader, you actually do less asking of irrelevant questions and you're really focused on leading heads up. That example data you gave was so powerful. As a leader, you want to come into your one-on-ones and be focused on how do you help somebody gain velocity? Yeah. How do you help them right, get the roadblocks out of the place? How do you help them think at the next level? And I think that's what this is about. It's not about how do we like over micromanage no. people yeah. and, and actually it's actually about how do we free up our time? So we focus oh, on the things where people actually need help. And that is so empowering for both the CEO with their team. It takes a lot of the stress out of one-on-ones because everyone's all on the same page before you get there and focus forward. And somebody else had a question about just a level down. When you do that cascading, everyone's having that same conversation. Everyone's focusing, how do I help you gain momentum? Because if you're the head of a function, your job is... 50% your team and 50% thinking about what's happening adjacent to your team. What information does your team need to understand the context of the rest? That's when a great leadership team is operating at full tilt. It's that everyone is trying to solve for the collective whole. And I think if you don't feel that way in your org, that's really, I think, what becomes so powerful from implementing this kind of approach to running a company. No, Margo, and that it's the difference between working in the business and working on the business. And I think for a lot of CEOs and as their founders in particular, right, as they're moving from one stage of the company to the next stage of the company, they're because they can't see that people are focused on the right things and headed in the right direction, because they can't see it, they don't believe it. Right. And so they spend a lot of time inspecting and asking and trying to, because they spend a lot of time worrying about, are we getting there from here? Right. And that anxiety shows up as you don't trust your team. You micromanage your, what are you doing over here? My department skipped four levels down from you trying to figure out what we're doing. Right. And it's literally because you can't see the teams are aligned and focused and pointed in the right direction. And you can't see the progress they're making. You don't believe 
that there's enough of it or that they are headed in the right direction. And part of the, to me, like the looking at it every day is the surface area I'm looking at is bigger, right? The opportunities, particularly we tripled headcount last year. I don't have any reason to expect that the 300 people we hired last year are suddenly and magically pros in their job, right? That's so a great point. bigger surface area, right? And so it's how can I look at the whole and the best opportunity have confidence that the right things are happening, right decisions and decision power is high. And then I can go focus on something else entirely. And if I don't have that insight, I don't have that transparency, almost every founder I know will just dig in and waste everybody's time and cause whiplash and <laughs> create fear and anxiety totally. that the inspection is coming and so on, right? Exactly right. So meeting, so that goes, just brings the whole thing full circle. Your executive team meetings are, and your team meetings on programs and projects are about gaining velocity, mm-hmm. right? It's not about inspecting progress because that's not what matters. What matters is how do you help your team go faster? And so Deidre, I think that's just why we're all so excited about what you've built and and how it can empower everybody. It, it is amazing. We could do a whole nother hour on what, what this does for you as a CEO, because your point about micromanagement, how many times have I heard from team members, oh, he's, he or she's <laughs> micromanaging you. Well, you don't need to micromanage if you've got great insight as to what's happening in the organization and you're spending your time in conversations with people about the path forward and how to be successful. Uh, I mean, I, I learned a lot from both of you today and I, I know other folks did as well. And, and like I said, I could do this for... <laughs> another hour, but I, I do want to be conscious of time. I think this was great. Maybe what we'll do is we'll, we'll get feedback and input and we can do a, a follow-up conversation uh, just, you know, about leadership teams and how, how they perform at a high level when, when working on these platforms, but this was great. And, and thank you, Deidre. Thank you, Margo. And uh, I'm sure everybody will love it. <laughs>